here tonight, uh, not to hear me speak, of course. We're here to hear Dr. Samueli speak. Uh, he is currently the principal of h &S Ventures. He's also the co-founder and chair of the Broadcom Foundation, and of course, owner of the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, you know, I could stand up here and we could spend 30 minutes talking about his accomplishments as a student, as an engineer, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as a C-level executive, as a board chairperson. Uh, but we're here to talk about something that may be even more remarkable than all those accomplishments, and that's his giving. Uh, in 1998, the Samueli Foundation was set up, and they help youth, they help uh, education, they help health, and they help Jewish culture and values. Those are the four things that they try to help. And you know, I wish I had a better adjective to describe how much they've helped our community. So I could say something like remarkable, I could say something like unbelievable, I could say spectacular, I'll let you guys try to come up with an adjective that actually fits. Uh, but I just made a very, very short list of how he's helped our local community and how the Samueli Foundation has helped. So in 1999, I remember the foundation was set in 1998. So in 1999, the foundation made a large gift to the UCI and UCLA engineering schools, which of course are named after them today. In 2000, the Samueli Theater was opened at the Orange County Performing Arts Center. In 2001, the Susan Samueli Center for Integrative Medicine was set up on UCI through a large gift, as well as the Samueli Jewish Campus here in Irvine. Uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2009, uh, he was a co-founder of the Broadcom Foundation. Uh, in 2012, he and his wife joined the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Giving Pledge. In 2013, they opened the Samuel Academy, which tries to educate underserved youth, especially foster students uh, and kids from our community. In 2017, they gave the largest gift in UCI history to set up the first of its kind College of Health Sciences. And this year in 2019, they gave $100 million to the Samuel A. School at UCLA. All told, if you were to add it up, and I had to get my calculator out, all right, so my PhD in finance was useless. The Samuels have given over 600, just I'm gonna repeat the number, $600 million to our community to help support it, so thank you. All right, so I've already spoken enough. All right, so we are incredibly uh, uh, thankful to have him here tonight to give us two other things. Uh, one is time, and the other is his knowledge about giving. So why don't you help me welcome Henry Samueli to the stage. Thank you so much. Oh, that was one hell of an introduction. <clears throat> I don't think I have to say anything. I can just listen, <laughs> listen to that a few times. <laughs> Upstairs, you promised me you were going to do all the talking. Uh, so I'm going to hold you to that. So, um, you know, we only have 30 minutes. And so I kind of just want to start off, you know, you know, not with your personal giving or, you know, not with, uh, you know, what your foundation has done. But, you know, I'd like to try to go back in time a little bit and, you know, have you think about, you know, how uh, your, your upbringing impacted you know how uh you you think about giving so if you want to talk sure. a little bit uh, about that no happy to um well i'll start with my parents my parents were born in poland and grew up there uh and had to endure the uh, world war ii holocaust uh, my mother was in hiding uh, for most of the war my father was in a concentration camp for part of the war fortunately they both survived after war they met were married in Europe and then uh, <clears throat> emigrated here to the U.S. to Buffalo, New York. So, and they came with virtually nothing, uh, the clothes on their back. So uh, I obviously had a very modest uh, up upbringing in, in Buffalo. I left there when the family moved out to California when I was 10, grew up in New York. But interestingly enough, in Buffalo, when they first arrived, they were on the receiving end of philanthropy because as it turned out, there were several organizations um, in the community that helped out new immigrants to the country to get them settled with housing, with jobs, food and clothing, whatever they needed. Uh, and they were helped by these organizations and they were so grateful for that. They, they certainly instilled with me from a young age the importance of giving back 
to those in need and those less fortunate than you. And that's been you know, pounded into me for my whole life. I mean, it's also an important uh, value within the Jewish culture. I, mean, I can't Im remember a, a sermon I've ever heard from a rabbi where they don't talk about giving back and helping those less fortunate. So it really is part of the culture, but it's also been part of my upbringing from the beginning. Even though it was a modest upbringing, again, you can be philanthropic and giving in many different ways. It's not just writing big checks. Yeah, I mean, uh, we always talk about how, of course, if you, you don't have a big check to give, one of the most valuable things, of course, you can always give is your time. Exactly. Um, all right, so we'll fast forward a little bit, because again, we have time limited. So fast forward to 1991. Uh, you start, you co-found Broadcom with uh, $5,000 of capital. I think in 1991, if I recall, it had about $44,000 in revenue. Uh, 93, you had 11 employees. 95, you moved to Irvine. Uh, 98, your IPO, and I think it was up 100% on the day it IPO'd. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just curious, you know, he smiled a lot on that one. Uh, that was one of the most exciting days of my life. Uh, yeah, I, obviously, it's accumulation of a lot of hard work paying yeah. off. Um, and so just curious, you know, at some point in there, I'm sure you, you thought about the, the wealth that you were creating for yourself. Um, and, you know, obviously right when you IPO'd in 98, you started the foundation, but you know, at what point did it really kind of hit you in that, you know, seven or eight year period where you thought, you know, I'm really going to be able to make a huge impact on the community with my wealth? Sure. Well, Susan and I talked about it a lot because, you know, the company was doing well and we kind of saw a good trajectory that things would go well and hopefully someday go public and who knows what, what it would create. So we did talk a bit about uh, that, the fact that we would start a foundation right away. And in fact, we did. Mike Schulman's here who runs our family office and helped us get that going right from the beginning. Um, so we set up the foundation right away knowing that we would immediately start giving back as soon as that stock had value. And fortunately, as you said, it had a lot of value <laughs> from the beginning. So we started writing lots of checks and big checks in the, in the early days. Uh, but it was not something we had to think a second about. We knew we were going to do it. We put it in place uh, and started from day one when the company went public, our path on philanthropy, which has you know, been over 20 years. Um, so when you started giving back, did you kind of have a process that you went through to think about where you'd give? Is it more ad hoc? Um, if you want to talk a little bit about sure. how you decided how, how to give. Well, it was a process of learning over the years. Giving money away is, I think, even harder than earning it. I tell you, it's, it's not easy <laughs> to do it well. Um, and in the beginning, we made lots of mistakes because, you know, when you go public, you're very visible, everybody knows you're rich, and, and you're just bombarded, overwhelmed with requests. And we didn't have a formal process for dealing with it and the formal structure in the foundation. So it, it's just, it was overwhelming in the early days. And so later on, a few years down the road, we brought in an, a, a, a consultant, an outside advisor, I think it was Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, I think they're even still around, to ask them, what should we do here? Because this is just too much to handle. So, and they gave us great advice. They, it turned out we were in the process of recruiting a new executive director who we brought in about 11 years ago, Gerald Solomon. Um, <clears throat> but they gave us some very wise advice and probably the, the most important advice is focus. Focus, focus, focus. You can't do everything for everybody. I've never seen a nonprofit I didn't like. They're all great. They're all doing wonderful things. <laughs> but there are a million of them out there, and you can't do everything. So they said, just decide what you want to do, what's important to you. Narrow down the mission of the, of the foundation as much as you can to the, the few areas that you're, you're interested in. And also start being more proactive rather than reactive in your philanthropy. In the early days, we're reactive, meaning we're just sitting back and the requests are coming in and we're just reacting to the request. Is that a good one? Is that a bad one? That's not a good way to approach it because they're all good. So how do you learn to say no properly? So narrowing down your mission is one way and being proactive where we decide what we want to do in a certain area, if it's you know, STEM education or health, 
and then put together a plan for how we're going to do that and proactively go out and do it and seek the nonprofits that you want to support. And that way you're in control of the giving and can do a much, much better and thoughtful job of doing it. Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about, you know, you said everything looks good to you, right? So you look at the menu and say, okay. Uh, at the beginning, and then you really narrow it down to just a few things where you decide to focus your money. And could, could you talk a little bit about the process and what you went through to kind of get sure. down to those final four? Exactly. Um, largely, most major givers, in fact, most givers in general, doesn't matter whether it's major or minor, uh, whatever you give, you typically give to things you're very passionate about, whether it's some personal experience, often health experiences drive a lot of philanthropy. Um, so no different than that for Susan and I, because again, our passions were around our personal experiences in life. Um, for both of us, for both Susan and, and myself, uh, we come from STEM backgrounds, myself being an engineer, and Susan did her undergraduate degree at Berkeley in, in math and worked for IBM as, as a programmer. So we both had STEM backgrounds, and because STEM, uh, STEM and engineering created my success. Uh, you know, going through UCLA, I earned all my degrees there, bachelor's, master's, PhD. Then I later went back and was a faculty member there for, for 10 years full time, then spun out and started Broadcom. So it's all due to my STEM education, the, the success we had. So I knew right from the beginning that our early gifts would be back to the universities that really helped us. So I think it was our first major gift was to the School of Engineering at UCLA that you mentioned. And I'm still deeply involved with them and, and on the Dean's Advisory Boards there and helping Chancellor as well, uh, as well as UCI. And the, and the connection to UCI came about because when I relocated down here to, to Irvine in 1995, the company did, um, it turned out that one of my colleagues at UCLA from my faculty days, Nick Alexopoulos, was hired to be the Dean of Engineering here at UCI and served as Dean for many, many years. And he, of course, roped me in on day one, says, Henry, you gotta get involved with UCI, see what it's all about, help us out. And he talked me into uh, a gift to, uh, to name the school here. So I did, and I've been involved with the UCI Engineering School from back 99. So both UCLA and UCI have been very close to me personally in, in engineering. And Susan has a deep passion for health. Uh, she's been practicing integrative health and medicine for 40 years. I mean, she's looked into all sorts of alternative treatments and, and therapies and, and nutrition and, and herbs and homeopathy and acupuncture, you name it, combined with conventional health care. Uh, it's been a passion her whole life. So we also very early on created the Center for Integrative Medicine here at UC Irvine. And that has evolved nicely over the last 20 years to our last uh, major gift to, in health to uh, create the College of Health Sciences and uh, the Integrative Health Institute uh, that she and I are still both very active in. So again, driven by a passion of Susan's. Then, Helping youth is also another passion of Susan's. Um, she was involved early on with the Orangewood Foundation and they uh, help foster youth here in Orange County and she's been on their board for many, many years. And then they came up with the idea of creating a high school that can help out not only foster youth, but co community youth as well. And that's where the idea came from for uh, starting the Samueli Academy and she's been on the board of trustees from day one there and very active and supportive in, in, of Orangewood and in, in their activities for foster youth. Um, so, and then uh, a fourth pillar, you mentioned Jewish culture, obviously coming from that background, parents going through the Holocaust. Um, it was very important to us to give back and both parents are no longer alive. Uh, on both sides, Susan's parents are no longer alive either. So it's obviously in their memories, we want to uh, give back and uh, we know they're up there watching down on us and uh, we're doing a good job for you guys. Um, but the Jewish culture portion of it was really important to us and, and you know, creating a, a society that's much more tolerant and understanding of differences in cultures and religions and races, etc. So uh, that's another area of, of giving for us. So 
And then a peripheral one, actually a fifth one you didn't even mention, was youth sports, especially hockey. Uh, obviously owning the Anaheim <laughs> Ducks, uh, we decided that we also want to get the kids excited about hockey and, and uh, sports in general, but specifically hockey. So we spent a lot of time over the last decade or so working on youth, sport, uh, youth hockey development. Uh, we just built this major uh, ice rink in Irvine. Um, that uh, not only the Ducks practice facility, but open to the community and youth and adult uh, hockey league. So, so youth sports and fitness is also maybe a, a fifth area that we've gotten into, but that's how we've narrowed the focus based all entirely on passions of either Susan or I. Oh, I, I got four out of five, that's not bad, yeah, right? Yeah, right, good. 80, 80 Without five. notes, I'm impressed. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, by, by the way, he is actually so officially a faculty at UCLA, mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'll, I'm sure they want me to note that. But, um, and UCI. And UCI, that's right. Uh, my apologies to the UCI. <laughs> 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 Do you think there's anyone from I'm UCI? officially a distinguished oh, adjunct correct. professor uh, the, of engineering uh, here at UCI. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad the provost left early. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably doesn't look good for me. But um, so one thing I just want to go back to, you know, uh, so you talked a lot about being proactive. And a lot of times you talked about the places you gave money. You talked about being on the board. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's always this, uh, you know, whether or not you give money and you just let them kind of run the money and you hope they act in your best interest or you're actively involved on the board right. and make sure that, you know, they're really pursuing the passion that you want them to. And do you have a, a rule in terms of yes. how, when you get active and when you don't get active? Absolutely. And you have to have very strict rules because I get invited to serve on boards almost daily. I get, just yesterday, I had to turn down being on the national board of the Girl Scouts. Um, so the requests come in constantly for you to serve on boards. Um, and this is just not only nonprofit boards, but for-profit boards, but those are easy to turn down. The only for-profit board I'm on is Broadcom and the NHL, I should say that. <laughs> uh, so there's two. <clears throat> but nonprofits, um, you have to draw a line because there's a big difference between writing a check and, and serving on a board. It's a serious commitment of time. Uh, serving on a board. So we are very uh, selective on that and only serve on the boards of the largest organizations that we give to. I don't mean lar largest gifts to organizations like UCI Health obviously is a major one. So Susan, not only on the board of trustees, but she's on the board of the College of Health Sciences and on the board of the Integrative Health Institute. She sees on three boards at UCI. I'm on the board of the College of Health Sciences as well as the board of the uh, School of Engineering as well as the School of Engineering at UCLA. And that's pretty much where we draw the line other than our own personal boards. I'm on the Ducks Foundation Board, the Samueli Foundation Board, the Broadcom Foundation Board. But I meant from outside unrelated uh, entities, we, we really have a, a, a hard line that we draw. Uh, and Susan's on the Samueli Academy Board, which is another area of major giving for us. So you really, when you do give a major gift, as you point out, it's not about just writing a check and hope they do the best with it. You really do want to be involved uh, and see if you can help out not only with your money, but with your expertise and your advice. So it, it really is important for major giving to, to give your time as well. And then for the advice for everybody else, it, it's not just major giving. I mean, even if you write a check for $20, if that's as much as you can afford, Giving your time is still extraordinarily valuable to that. Nonprofit organizations need volunteers at all levels, no matter how small or how big, volunteers are critical. So don't worry about just writing checks. Writing time checks are just as important as writing cash checks. So that's a, a word of advice to everybody. Please volunteer. Thank you, and we always need volunteers at the center, so uh, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just add that. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, so you, you, you give the gifts for the major gifts, you're of course on the board. Uh, so one topic that's really come up a lot for kind of the nonprofit program we do at the center, uh, another thing that's come up, in fact, we just, uh, Leanne and I just met, uh, Leanne's the executive director of the center, um, she and I just met with a large nonprofit here in Orange County, uh, very large. And you know, one of the issues that we always, and all we nonprofits have, is measuring impact and proving impact of the giving. 
And so, um, you know, how do you show the donors you're, you're doing well with their money and you're stewarding their money and that you're making a marginal difference in the community? And so, right. you know, I'd be curious, you know, the different ways you think about impact and measure impact. Yes, no, it's a critical part. And that's, again, another aspect of being proactive about your philanthropy and being involved in the organization. So when we do give out gifts, and these are small as well as large, um, Gerald, our, our foundation executive director, works very closely with the organization to set out exactly what they're gonna do with the money and what goals and milestones they expect to achieve uh, with the money. And he follows it and checks it because you know, they're gonna come back the next year for a renewal and additional money. So he, he actually holds their feet to the fire and says, what have you done? Show me your results, your milestones. And it's, you know, it's different than financial milestones at a for-profit company. You know, nonprofit milestones are much more nebulous, but they're still measurable. You know, your impact on the community, how many kids did you help, how many scholarships did you give out? You know, there's, there's always metrics that you can come up with. And I think it's important, especially if you're on the board, then you're clearly deeply involved, that you make sure that there are metrics that are set and that they are measured on a regular basis and you track it much like you would for a for-profit board. And do you use that data often to do due diligence on a organization before you give money? Or Absolutely, what? no, it's a critical part of the diligence process is what have you done in the past? You know, how fiscally responsible have you been? There are a lot of nonprofits out there that spend willy-nilly and run out of money, and then all of a sudden, they, you know, they're begging everybody for every last dollar because I'm gonna go bankrupt next week. I mean, that's just, you gotta run a foundation much like a business, and you gotta think forward in your budgeting and, and spend wisely and not overspend. So he looks at their financial track record. He goes on to the websites that you can track. Uh, Charity Navigator is an example that measures the, uh, and ranks uh, nonprofits and gives them you know one star through four stars or five stars whatever, so he checks that as well. So no, definitely due diligence on past performance of foundations is important for future giving. Uh, so speaking of future giving, that's a, a good segue to my next question. So you talked a lot about how your parents instilled the giving culture in you. Uh, and so obviously you have three daughters, I believe, or three children? Three daughters, two grandchildren. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, you're trying to do the same with them. And uh, if you want to talk about a little bit of how you encourage them to give and empower them to give right. back. It's important. And we do talk to them a lot about it. And Mike knows we have lots of meetings to talk to try to educate them on the responsibility that being wealthy uh, entails. And, um, you know, they went through obviously a different upbringing than I did, that they didn't have the parents going through the hardships. You know, they, they lived with wealth since they were young kids. So um, what we're trying to do is make the foundation much more visible to them, rope them in, get them involved, give them small budgets to give away every year. Uh, and each one takes to it differently. Our youngest turns out to be the one that's the most interested in the foundation. You know, she's traveled to Africa to help out girls in Ethiopia. She's, she's getting very actively involved. So we think that she'll probably ultimately be the one to, to take it over. And the other ones are less interested, but not zero, but less. Um, but it is important to us. So we are trying to talk to them about all of our giving. We show them the, the entities we give to and why we're passionate about certain areas. We ask them what passions they have and how do they wanna give in the future. So yes. Uh, passing on that philosophy to the kids and the grandkids hopefully someday is important and it takes a lot of work to do that. It's, it doesn't come automatically. Sure. In fact, side story, the giving pledge that we joined in, in 2012, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, some of the world's wealthiest people. It was started by um, Bill Gates and his wife Melinda and Warren Buffett. And it's, uh, it gets together philanthropists with the philosophy that you're gonna give away the majority of your wealth in your lifetime. It's not contractually obligated, it's just a, a moral commitment. Um, so of like-minded individuals and they get together every year and they have interesting discussions, discussions and one of the discussions they always have is the children and the grandchildren. How do they get them involved? How much money to give them 
uh, not only just in your estate, but you know, in, in, in philanthropy. And the, the viewpoints vary wildly. No, there is no one answer to this question. There's some philanthropists out there who say they're gonna give away 99% of their wealth to philanthropy and give their kids very little. Others say, well, I wanna give a lot to my kids so that they can be more philanthropic and set up large foundations. And, and there's no simple answer to it. And I think a lot of it depends on how your kids take to philanthropy. If, they, if they're more interested in it, then you're naturally gonna to wanna to give them more to be able to give away. But it's, it's always a trade-off. How much goes to charity? How much goes to family? No easy answer. Well, I hope your oldest two daughters like engineering then. <laughs> <laughs> the youngest is the one who went into science. Oh, <laughs> well, we know who the favorite is then. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, you guessed it. Uh, uh, they're all great, obviously. But, uh, they, all have, they all have different interests and... Uh, we love them all and, and we support them in everything they do, quite literally. They're, they're, they're well supported and, and encouraged to pursue whatever dreams and passions they have. Uh, I apologize, I think my middle child <laughs> syndrome came out a little bit there. Right. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanna ask one more question. I wanna open the, the, the questions up to the audience here. So you know, there's a, probably a lot of people in the room that either are thinking about how they could give back, um, thinking about how they get started giving back, or maybe they know that they're gonna give back one day like you did when you were young um, and are looking for a way to get started. So you have maybe two or three tips for someone who hasn't started giving yet that's out there that's wondering how they could get started, you know, because obviously sure. you had a huge foundation and mm -hmm. a lot of people to help you and they might not have that same. Yeah, I would say structure. don't worry about the money side of it initially. I would say volunteer a little bit, find organizations out there that resonate with you for one reason or another and volunteer some time uh, with them because you'll learn about you know, philanthropic giving just by being part of these organizations and donating some time to them. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to volunteer and serve on advisory boards or formal boards, you'll meet, <coughs> you'll meet the other uh, board members and learn from them about their giving. So uh, just getting involved in an organization that you know resonates with you, I think is, the best advice I can give. Don't worry about writing checks in the beginning. It'll come naturally. Once you find the organizations, you fall in love with them, you see what their needs are. They have big needs, they have small needs, they have this little project, they have that big project. You can always find something that fits your giving level, but it's first important to get that emotional attachment to the organization. So that's what I would recommend first. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. All right, so open up for questions. We have a few uh, folks running around with uh, microphones. So if you have a question for Dr. Simio, if you want to raise your hand up. Um, who, go ahead. Who what? First of all, Dr. Sangoli, thank you for being here. And also thank you for your giving. Your philanthropy really inspired me to go into advancement and development in higher education. So thank you so much for, for everything that you've done for higher ed and philanthropically. Um, my question is a little tangential, forgive me, because I'm an athlete. So, one, what was it like buying the Ducks in the franchise? <laughs> and then two, I've always wanted to ask this question to an owner of a major franchise. What is it like to be a fan of the team that you own? <laughs> Great questions. Um, so how did we get into it? We, it almost was an opportunistic buy. It wasn't that I was looking to buy a sports team. Uh, I wasn't at all. Um, but it turned out that Disney, um, who owned both the Angels and the Ducks at the time, was looking to get out of sports ownership. They decided we're much better making movies and running theme parks and we shouldn't be owning sports teams. So they decided to, uh, to sell the team. And, and roughly the same time, a little earlier, it turns out that the city of Anaheim was looking for somebody to operate and manage the Honda Center because the prior manager went bankrupt and, and gave it back to them. So they needed help there. So we first actually uh, engaged with the city of Anaheim and, and did a deal to run the Honda Center. And then the following year, it turns out Disney was looking to sell the team. And since we ran the facility that had them as a tenant, um, we thought it would be a perfect opportunity to, to uh, push in that direction. So. 
interestingly enough, I was pretty scared because I know nothing about sports management and ownership. Uh, Susan was the one who pushed me, said, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> um, so because of her, we, we ended up doing it, and it was a phenomenal decision. Uh, we're so happy we did. Um, and then your second question, what's it like to be a fan as well as an owner of a sports team? Um, it's an emotional roller coaster, I can guarantee you that. Because <laughs> if you think it's bad as a fan going through the roller coaster, multiply that by an order of magnitude and how depressed I get every game that they lose <laughs> and how elated I am when they win. And Susan, the same way. We, you know, we drive home, but we, they lost uh, the, uh, yesterday or the day before, or whatever. So we're driving home with our heads in our lap. <laughs> oh, man, they lost, they lost. It's just one game out of 82. Um, but you go through huge emotional highs and lows because you're so invested in, in the outcome of every game. But it's fun. It's, it's an enormous joy because it's so different than business. Where business, you make investments and then you've got to wait years to see whether it's a good investment, bad investment. Sports, you know right away. I mean, <laughs> certainly within a year, but usually within two hours, you know yeah. whether things are going well or not going well. So you get much more instant gratification or disappointment in sports than you do in business. So that's one nice thing about it. I like that. You know, it's just moving up and down emotionally as opposed to being in a very steady state as you tend to be in business where decisions take you know, months, quarters, years to, to turn around and have an impact. All right, next question. We got a hand over here, right behind you, Julian. Uh, Dr. Simon, thanks a lot for being here. Um, first, as an undergraduate and master's in electrical engineering at UCLA, I was fortunate to see the name of the school change from School of Engineering and Applied Science to Henry Samuel Lee overnight <laughs> as a part of that uh, Thank time you. frame. Uh, so the question for you is, uh, I, I think about some of the more structural problems in the US, and the ones that are very glaring to me are homelessness and lack of facilities for inner city schools. For what schools? Inner city schools. Like in oh, inner city schools, yeah, yeah. So, why are these problems so difficult to solve in your opinion and what can be done to eradicate some of these things? Um, well, they are big problems. I mean, they take lots of money. I mean, that's the, really the biggest issue is it's such a widespread problem that, that it demands huge amounts of money. And it's everyone's responsibility to, to participate in solving the problem. I don't think you can point your finger and say, you should solve it, you should solve it. We all need to collectively solve it. Uh, in our own way as much as we can afford. So, um, and it's going to take billions and billions of dollars, so no one person is going to solve these problems. So, um, it's just a collect, it's got to move to top of mind, and uh, we have to collectively go out there and, and work with our local politicians and create the right organizations. I know here in, in Orange County, United Way is very, proactive on, on the homelessness. I think that is now their number one issue that they're going after and we're working very closely with them. So it's nice to have one major nonprofit who collectively is going to work with everybody in the community to drive an issue and, and thanks to United Way for doing that. So yes, it's, it's a challenge but no easy solution. We all have to work together. One, uh, yeah. Someone pick somebody for me. I can't see all the hands. I don't, I love all of you equally. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. I was uh, close to classmates, I think, with two of your other founders, Kevin and Steve. Ah, wonderful. But, uh, but uh, I have a question for you in terms of you know, going back to this gentleman's question and the original question. So you're part of the NHL Board of Governors, right? You have your foundation, you have the Players Association. Have you strategically, or have you broached the subject with the Board of Governors? Players Association to uh, you know, leverage and make a greater impact towards solving you know, some of these macro level issues that you guys are uniquely in position to do. And, and how is any of those discussions go, or is that even of interest to the Board of Governors? And no, it absolutely is of interest. They, they have a senior executive, probably a you know, senior vice president level person who's dedicated to uh, social uh, responsibility issues. Uh, and you know, working on you know, making the NHL green and in terms of energy usage and more sustainable, you know, dealing with uh, the, the lower income families and making the sport more accessible. So there are all sorts of league-wide initiatives to deal 
with being more socially responsible and they have staff dedicated to that and they work with all the teams. So yes, absolutely it is being done. Does the players association, are they embracing or are they being dragged along? No, no, no. The players association embraces it. it, it it's really nice to see how the players themselves individually love to volunteer to get involved in these community activities. The Ducks Foundation works with them on a regular basis. Uh, they go to Chalk as one of our major uh, recipients of funds from the Ducks Foundation, and the players are visiting Chalk all the time. Um, so no, they love working with the kids and with the underserved and with the handicapped. We have a, uh, a, a league that we're creating for sled hockey for the uh, uh, for those who, who've lost limbs and so forth. So we're doing all sorts of things to try to help uh, those in need. And uh, it's very heartwarming to see that the players are very actively involved. All right, one last question. Uh, the woman in the back here, she's enthusiastically got her hand up back there, so. Hello, Dr. Samueli. Thank you for being here. I actually volunteer at the academy, and tomorrow's the final Thank you. Today, so I have Thank to get you. bright and early. And I got to spend some time with Susan at Orangewood and Chalk events, raising money. And as a member of the Jewish community, I also support a lot of organizations in our um, community. So my question to you is this. What is your take on um, giving money throughout your lifetime versus leaving a large endowment at the end of your life? Is one <coughs> preferable over the other, or is it a combination sure. of both? I think it's certainly for Susan and I, it's, it's much more prefer preferable to give in your lifetime, during your lifetime, because you want to see the impact of your gifts. I mean, if you give after you're dead, obviously you don't see it. <laughs> or maybe you do from up high somewhere. Like my parents are seeing all our giving, so that's an example. But it's certainly nice to see the benefit of, of your philanthropy while you're alive. So that's why we started from day one when Broadcom went public. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to gauge how much because you don't know what your wealth is going to look like over time whether it's gonna grow, whether it's gonna shrink. So you have to be very careful not to overgive because then you'll end up without any money at all. Um, so um, inevitably you'll end up with a bunch at the end that you'll hopefully you know, set up as an endowment for future generations. But as much as possible, I say, you know, it's, it's much more beneficial to do it in your lifetime. Well, well Dr. Samuel, I thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, sharing your... Thank you. And, uh, and sharing your knowledge and time. Uh, so before you go, though, uh, we have uh, three special guests here who uh, he wasn't supposed to know were here, but he actually met him them at the <laughs> VIP reception. Uh, so they're, uh, they're, they're grabbing something here. So oh, we have to fill, fill dead space. <laughs> uh, dance. Yeah, there, you, there you go. You can do a dance. or. Uh, I can't beat that dancing, so I'm not, uh, here we go. Uh, so guys, come on up. So we have a handheld mic up here that works, or here, you can use my mic. Oh, here we go. All right, All right so uh, who do we got here? Why don't you just say your name and... Hello, my name is Valerie and I am a junior. Good evening, my name is Diana Marquez and I'm a junior in Ponsoni Academy. Hello, my name is Jeremiah Rodriguez and I'm a freshman at San Miguel Academy. All right, and what, you, what are you holding there? This is a jersey. A right. jersey we have for. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little nervous. All right, that's okay. <laughs> All right, so. Um... my own mic. I don't need that. Um, so uh, we don't have a hockey team here at UCI. Um, we wanted to, but we need uh, to fix that. <laughs> you can probably help with that. Yeah, I probably uh, could. <laughs> um, but so what we do here, uh, why don't you open up the jersey there. So we have a jersey here uh, for you, uh, Dr. Samueli. Oh, so, wow. Uh, so a little bit of background um, on the jersey. So we don't have a hockey team, uh, but we do have a team that plays three nights a year at the Honda Center. And that is the UCI basketball team when we win the Big West tournament and go to March Madness every year. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, so this is a, a basketball jersey we got for you, of course, with your name because you're part of the UCI team. I need to gain some weight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm probably maybe a little height too, no offense. Uh, 
And of course, uh, for those that don't know, the number 18 is very significant in Jewish giving. Uh, it means chai, uh, which means life. And so often Jewish giving is made in multiples of 18. So we have the number 18 here for you. Uh, and then last but not least, you can see all the signatures here. So uh, my center, uh, well, not my center, but the Center for Investment Wealth Management that I'm the faculty director of, uh, we have a program called Life Fest, where we bring ninth and 10th graders who would be the first in their families to go to college, to campus. Um, and uh, we're fortunate, like the Samuel Academy, to have a lot of people in the audience, my the center members, uh, individual donors. Pacific Life here gave us a transformational gift this year to let us put on the program. And we, uh, uh, we talked to nonprofits and schools about which kids we should have on the program. And it just so happens we've had a number of students that, that attend the Samuel Academy. And so each student that's been here wrote a little message for you oh, on the back wonderful. and a little thank you. And uh, there great. is one student that couldn't make it and sign the jersey, but that's because she's in college in Riverside and she was naval. So uh, <laughs> that's we a hope good you excuse. enjoy the gift and-, and uh, Thank you so much. Thank you.